So, hey, Tomodachi, welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we are going to do chapter three of the Blue Eyed Samurai. And we're just going to drive right into it. So, I just took off uh, from Denmark and arrived in Japan and had my first meal, which was a ramen, which is actually a Chinese noodle dish at that time. Um, anyway, here we go. Um, chapter three, finding Hombu. The next morning, I felt different. It's hard to explain... But normally I have a hard time getting out of bed. Well, from the moment I came to myself and realized where I was, I was fully alert and ready for just about anything. I didn't feel hungry, but just wanted to get on with my new life. We packed our bags and left the Kimi Ryokan at about 9 o'clock. Our appointment with Sosai was at 10 a.m. Outside, Shihan Boots gave me a map and said, Okay, find us Hombu. And I was like looking at this map going, What? And he says, Well, boy, you are here now, so you might as well learn your way around. Take us to Hombu. <laughs> mm, I stood there looking at this map of Ikebukuro not knowing where either north or south was and now what uh, I started down the street and got all the way down to the first big street light and then I took a wrong turn after walking for about five minutes Shian stopped me and said that he better lead the way or we would be late for our meeting with Sosai <laughs> yeah he had that right once we turned the corner um, that took us to the small park in front of Hombu I started getting goosebumps all over again Struggling to keep up because of all my luggage, I was almost bumped into uh, one of the Japanese fighters that I had never uh, met before. And it was Matsui Senpai at the time. He is now Kancho, obviously. He was on his way out from Hombu, but was kind enough to stop and greet us. Um, I'd actually done a summer camp with him in Denmark a couple of years previously. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed his teaching back then. Uh, I think he, he vaguely remembered me. Anyway, of course I didn't talk to him, but Shihan seemed happy to see him and they shook hands and spoke briefly. I had the honor of training with Matsui Senpai two years earlier on an annual Danish camp. Yes, that year I had done my green belt test and did one of my five rounds of sparring with Matsui Senpai. The fighting that year was held on the last day of the camp at 6.30 in the morning. Matsui Senpai made us do something like the morning training the Uchideshi do. It consisted of a lot of kinds of exercises and the ones which we had to pair up to do, I was lucky enough to pair up with him. Even today, I recall that camp as one of the best I've ever done, second only to the one with Michael Thompson. I was sure that the camp was just another one of many Matsui Senpai had been to and therefore would not remember me. But when Shihan Boots asked if he could remember, he said yes. And then Shihan told him that I was here to be Uchideshi for three years. He gave me a serious look and said, do your best in English. <laughs> but that time I was nervous enough. <clears throat> but that time I was nervous enough to say us to just about anybody and anything. And that was all I managed to say us. After that, he left us to enter Hombu. The first thing that strikes you when you enter Hombu is the way the Uchideshi on, the, on duty greets you with a loud us. That's what they say. Say, excuse me, what are you here for? Anyway, uh, an acquired request for what you want. Shihan Boots told the Uchideshi that we were here to meet Sosai, uh, who then told us to sit down and wait for our turn. Shihan was called up shortly afterwards while I was told to stay and wait. Suddenly I felt very alone. And for the first time since I had left Denmark, I find myself in a new place without knowing anybody. But I was about to meet the main reason for leaving Denmark. Oyama Sosai. So. Oyama Sosai. Ooh, this was exciting times. I had to wait for more than an hour, but while sitting there, I had some serious time to think things through. Things like, is this really what you want? And are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? I don't know if I ever came to any conclusions because there really wasn't any con um, questions about if I was going to be ready for it because I was already there. Anyway, what was the food going to be like? How are the people I was going to stay with? Sitting there, I was lost in my own thoughts and I was suddenly told to follow the Uchideshi upstairs. He ran over to me and said, Come on, follow me! Us! Like that in Japanese. And I was like, oh, us! So, you know, it was kind of uh, <laughs> sprinting up the stairs to the third floor where Sosai was. And then he says right there in front of me, he goes, Before you enter, this is what I think he said, Before you enter, you have to say, Us, shimasu. And at that time, my Japanese level of speaking was absolutely zero. I only knew uh, karate words like ushiro maashigiri and maashigiri and stuff like that. So when he goes, Os, shimasu, this is what you have to say in a very powerful voice. I was like super nervous. But so this is what happened. And I'm going to go a little bit off script here because I feel like I can explain this better than the book does. He then steps in in front of me and goes, Os, shimasu, like that. And then I go in and I say, Os, and I just stumbled on it. And then... Sosai sits there behind his desk and he slowly raises himself up 
as a bear coming off. He goes, welcome to Tokyo. And he walks over and he shakes my hand. And I swear that moment of this beefy hand, like embracing my hand, felt like literally I was shaking the hand of a god. For us, he was a living God, um, and he really was the impersonation of it. If you've ever been in complete awe of meeting a person ever in your life, this is what ex- exactly what it felt like. I started to shake, and I don't even know why. I was so nervous, my whole body was shaking. I couldn't stop shaking. I almost passed out. This is how much in awe I was. Um, so here it comes. Os, welcome to Tokyo, he says. And while saying this, he came out from behind the desk and shook my hand. He then told me to sit down and I was still in shock. Sitting there at the same table as him was something I'd never thought of even in my wildest dreams. He was a living God to me. And there he was sitting and talking to me. He was talking to me. Yes. There was someone there translating uh, for me and I could understand what he was saying. But being in that state, I wasn't really listening. I simply was awestruck. It, was not, it wasn't until she unnudged me that I woke from my trance and said, Are you listening? And I was like, Oh! Um... This was David Bunt who was translating at the time, actually. This is all I remember from our first conversation. You have come here to Japan to become one of my uchideshi. And that means you have given up your normal life to devote yourself to karate. Because of this, I expect your best. In one year, I want you to train hard and challenge for the black belt. In two years, I want you to be able to gain the Nidan, second degree black belt. And in your last year, I want you to take the, thir- the, the test for third dan and finish as a third dan before you go back to your country. Um, only one has ever done that before and that is your senpai Takiyama. he used to train three times every day and sometimes during the night too next you have now left your family behind and therefore I want you to think of me as your father and teacher if you ever need to talk to me about something do not ever hesitate now I will introduce you to the other foreign uchideshi it's very powerful words and very kind of him um, and I felt very warm and welcome there as the translation was finished, they all came running in, announcing themselves with strong, clear osses. Os, my name is Mokram. I am from France, third year student. Os, my name is Judd Reed. I am from Australia, second year. Os, my name is Nathan Ligo. I am from North Carolina, second year student. I stood up and shook each of their hands. And then after they left Solsai, uh, they stood up and shook my hand while saying, do your best. And then I had to go and sign the contract, which stated that I agreed to stay there for three years. <laughs> yeah, there was actually a contract. Um, and that I would do my best to uphold the Kyokushin, uh, the Kyokushin way. As I sat there and read the contract, I remember thinking that it was like entering prison, only I agreed to do it on my own free will, and I had flown halfway across the world to enroll in some kind of program that I didn't even know anything about. I had literally no clue what was going to happen the next day. Once out of Sosai's office, we went downstairs, and the foreign Uchidesi were waiting for us. We had left our bags down in the lobby, and as I had just signed up uh, as an uchideshi, I was told to move my things into the dormitory. Shihan had asked permission from Sosai to stay with me for a few days, so we were both going to move in there and stay for the first few nights. Um, The year was 1991, and it was March 30th, when I was officially entered into the dormitory and accepted as Sosai's uchideshi. It was a fine day, and I had, and as I carried my bags back to the dormitory, my heart was filled with anticipation. Laigo, being the youngest of the foreign uchideshi, felt it was his duty to explain how things were. Uh, the first thing he said was, always greet your senpai with a loud os. And if you don't know whether he is your senpai or not, then os him anyway. And by the way, everybody here is your senpai. <laughs> oh, by the way, everybody here is your senpai. Oh, that's great. Don't ever look your senpai in your eyes because that is being disrespectful. Always enter a room by greeting it with two oses. Os, os. One for being rude for entering and one to whomever might be there before you. Yep, these were the rules. By this time, we had gotten around the back and stood facing a small alley which led towards the dormitory. There we stopped and Ligo explained to me that we now had to pass through the dining room where the cook was always working and as uh, she had direct connections to Solsai, always be careful of what I did around her. I wasn't quite sure what that meant but figured that I would know soon enough. When we walked down the narrow back alley and then ended at the open door which led into the dormitory, there we had to take our shoes off and wear a pair of slippers. This is tradition in Japan. You take your shoes off in, indoors. Uh, carrying my bags, I followed Laigo and Shihan into the dining room and did as I'd been told for greeting uh, as going inside the room. Os, 
excuse me for entering the room. Us. And another us for Diobasan. Diobasan means like the mother or the, of the dormitory, like kind of stuff. Yeah. And she was a lady around 75 maybe at the time. Yeah. She was very small, but very powerful. And uh, yeah, she cooked really good food actually. Um, so anyway, she came storming out of the kitchen. I wanted to know what was going on. She was like all oh, super excited. I don't think she knew I was coming. Uh, Ligo, being able to speak some Japanese, explained that I was going to be at Uchideshi and that I had come over from Denmark. Also, my Shihan was going to stay with me for a few days. She showed quite a temper at being troubled by more guests than expected, but soon told us to hurry upstairs with our bags. This is um, a very uh, a common reaction in Japan, like, you know, because like, she's not expecting that now there are more people that she needs to cook more food for, and she hadn't been told, so that's probably why she was a bit excited. I actually ended up becoming really good friends with her. She was really, really nice. I look at her as my uh, grandmother in Japan, actually. Before we could get a chance to leave the dining room, she, told, uh, she took hold of Ligo and made him tell us never to be late for any of the three meals that were served. I hardly understood what was going on, except that I was able... Uh, to make sure that I got up for breakfast the next morning and that I wouldn't get any meals today because she didn't know we were coming. And that's just the way it is. It's okay. Once I had done my os out of the kitchen, I found myself in a very narrow corridor that had access to a tiny little toilet, which Ligo told me was only for you to use for the senpai. He then led us up a super narrow, steep staircase, um, which was awkward to like uh, navigate with the bags I had in my hand. On the second floor, it was like being at a crossroads. You had on the left side, uh, the senpai's rooms, and then there, were, there was a big senpai room and a tiny little senpai room. And on the right side was the big room for us, um, first year and second year Uchideshi. There was also um, two, well, I think one or two? can't remember now. There was at least one toilet upstairs. I think maybe there were two toilets upstairs. One of them was used for the first years and second years. And the other one beside it, yeah, there were two upstairs. Uh, the second one beside it was uh, only for using for the senpais. So the third years had uh, potentially three different rooms that they could stay in. Uh, the one on the left side, um, the little one in, in the this tiny little one where Mokaram was staying. Um, and then there was also a, a room downstairs uh, right beside the, the dining dining room. Generally speaking, the, the room downstairs was occupied by uh, the the Ryocho, which is the head of the um, the head of the dormitory. And at this time, it was Minami Senpai. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, don't ever go in there unless you are called for a warn Largo. There was a door into the smallest room I've ever seen. Mokaram was staying in there, and he always kept his door open so that you could always see inside. The room was six square meters. And it had uh, what would be back shelf where you could put some stuff on. And the shelf took up like a third of the room. So it's like there was a shelf and then his bed would be underneath there. I actually stayed there for a year. So uh, I actually uh, kind of liked that room. It was a bit of an awkward room because inside the room, like, yeah, people who had come and, and visited that room and stayed in the dormitory as guests had like written stuff all over the wall. So you could see stuff from senpais over the last 30 years that had written stuff. I thought it was... A kind of a, a ritually weird room to be in. But anyway. Uh, anyway, beside his room, there was a small sink where you could shave or brush your teeth. It only had cold water, so in the winter, it could be pretty bad to shave. Across from the small room where Mokoram stayed, which, although small, was considered luxury, uh, was the last door, also the close, closest to the stairs. It gave access to the main room in which both the first and second years would stay. It was a big room and could easily fit 10 or more guys. In Japan, most people slept on the floor and what they call a futon, which is a thin mattress that can be folded up and put away fairly easy. During the day, you can then use the room for something else other than sleeping. It is one of the, those things that Japan has been forced to come up with because everything, uh, everywhere you go, things are small and space is costly. So converting your bedroom into a living room by stacking your bed in the closet during the day is quite common in Japan. Somebody had laid out the beds uh, we were going to sleep on and Ligo told us just to do whatever we liked for the time being. It was now that he told me that someone must have mixed up the dates because the new Uchideshi were not expected until the end of next month. I had showed up a month early and now was stuck there with all these senpai and no one to look after or learn from. I figured that whatever I did I could probably find out in the time if anything was wrong. I was so nervous all the time and I didn't know if I was doing right or wrong. Um, I also found that I was dead tired and that my cold, uh, although temporarily forgotten, had come back to thump me on the head. Xi'an seemed a bit tired from the last few days and suggested we took a nap. It took me all of seven seconds before I fell asleep. <laughs> I woke up sometime during the afternoon to find Xi'an was gone. I was alone in the big room. We called it the big room. 
It was still cold in Japan, and during the night it could uh, it could still get close to freezing. So I was glad I had kept my clothes on while sleeping. I felt a bit hungry and was sitting there considering what options I had for getting some food when Shihan came in the room, uh, <clears throat> in through the door and said, "Let's go get something to eat. There's someone I want you to meet." And that solved my problem. That was great. Shihan Boots took me back uh, the way we had come in the same morning. I remembered to do my os. And then we went back around to Hombu, where the translator from a meeting with Sosa was waiting for us. Um, Mukran was hanging around at the same time, and so David Bunt, the translator, uh, asked him if he wanted to join us for some ramen, Japanese noodles. Actually, ramen, this is a long story. Uh, I consider ramen Japanese dish, but originally they're Chinese. It's just the Japanese have gotten them so complex uh, uh, that um, I actually consider that ramen is a Japanese original thing to, to call. Yeah. At that point, I seriously started wondering when I could get some real Japanese food. All I had had since I arrived had been Chinese dishes, <laughs> is what I thought back in the day. Anyway, he took us just around the corner from Hombu out on the main street. Uh, the smells and sounds were still so foreign to me that even the smallest things would seem to stand out. I was lucky that they had a glass cabinet outside the restaurant with plastic imitations of all their dishes so I could choose one that looked like the one I had had at the airport, which was a miso ramen, by the way. The place was full of people and we ended up sitting at the big table, which we had to share with other customers, which I found very strange. You just sit around this big table and everyone's just, you know, sharing the dinner table like that. Um, I soon realized that this is just another way for the Japanese to utilize their space. Space is a major problem in Japan and they tend to use everything to its utmost. I first thought about it when I saw the foldable futons and then later when we were sitting there in a small restaurant sharing tables with complete strangers. Anyway, before I start talking about things that are not really related to my real story, I had better get back on track. <laughs> before leaving Denmark, uh, my branch chief had given me some advice on different things and some of those gold coins will come up as I go along. But this time was the first time I was in doubt about what to do. Shihan Boots had told me that whatever you are given, you have to thank them sincerely and if ever you are offered any food, always eat everything. I was struggling to finish my soup uh, Having filled up my stomach with all the noodles, I wasn't sure eating. I wasn't able to eat very much at one time, and found it hard to finish even a normal bowl of ramen. Uh, the others had lost me in the beginning of the conversation while they started talking about senpais and shihans, whom I had never heard of before. So I just sat there listening and trying to empty my bowl. When they had all eaten theirs, I was still trying to finish my soup. They kept on talking, and I kept on staring at my soup. This went on for about fifteen minutes until I finally built up the courage to ask if it was okay not to finish my soup. Shihan just looked at me as if he didn't know what I was talking about and said, if you can't eat it, you don't force yourself. Um, please remember that because with Sosai, that was not possible. The food that you're given, you have to eat. I couldn't believe it. He had just gone back on one of the first bits of advice he had given me. It was okay to leave something if he couldn't eat it. I was soon to learn that Xi'an must have been preoccupied with his talking because once back in the dorm, I was told another story. Always finish everything on your plate or bowl, right down to the last rice grain. It is considered rude in Japan not to finish all your rice because of the disrespect to the people working in the rice fields and also the symbolic value of the rice crops. Rice in Japan uh, and most of the rest of Asia is considered the same as bread and butter to the Western world. So respect is paid in full to what we, our parents, our forefathers, and the generations that are to come are growing up on. The symbolic value of the rice crop is recognized in the character of the rice, which comes, uh, which goes something like this in Japanese proverb. Kome wa iraku naru hodo atama sagemasu. And it means the, the, the more mature that the uh, the rice crop becomes, the more it's, it lowers its heads. So it, it symbolizes that you have um, uh, humbleness as, as you are uh, better up in, in life kind of thing. So it's like the, the stronger, the better, the, the more noble that you become, the, the more humble you should become. That's kind of what it says. Uh, I'm not sure how I translated this. It goes, the mightier the rice crop becomes, the more it bows its head. And that's probably a pretty good... Um, uh, translation of that, yeah. It's a sign of respect to bow your head to someone. So it all comes together. It all ties together. That night, as we, as we had been told that there weren't being any dinner prepared for us, Xi'an said he wanted to take me to his favorite restaurant in the whole world. I was starting to think we might finally get some Japanese food in some fancy place, but we ended up in a tiny place filled with people standing up and waiting to be seated. From the outside, the place looked like it, had been, it hadn't been clean in the last 15 years, and it smelled like nothing I'd ever smelled before. There was something I had come to notice a lot since arriving, that everything smelled different. 
I wasn't quite sure whether I liked the smell of the place or not. It was just different, something I hadn't encountered before. I was having a good time trying to identify the smells when we were seated. Once sat down, the waiter brought us glasses of water and asked me what we wanted. Yeah, that's completely what they do in Japan. They give you free glasses of water and also, generally speaking, um, something to wipe your hands with. Um, I gave Shihan a look to say that I didn't know what I wanted and he suggested that I had the same as him. The place was famous for its giant gyoza. Chinese rolls fried in uh, water on a pan. Very good, actually. Also, it's like a side dish for ramen. Now, this place was not a ramen shop. It was a gyoza shop. And so they had these massive dumplings, like almost as big as my forearm. Um, and they were really good, actually. Like, really good. Yeah. Sitting there eating our Chinese dishes, again, <laughs> Xi'an told me, how he had first gotten to know about the place 10 years previously he had spent 15 months living and training in japan and during that time the famous uchideshi takiyama senpai had still been training at hombu they had become friends and sometimes they had gone out for lunch or dinner and one day he had told shian that he knew of this place where they served the most amazing gyoza so they had gone to the restaurant and enjoyed a silent meal together sitting there telling me this story it was like shian was back in those days and that for him time always seemed to stop when leaving japan Every time he returned, it always felt like time had just took up from where it had started and picked up again. I sensed in him some inner passion for Japan and maybe also that he wished that he could be me, that it was him that was about to begin the journey and uh, not me. But, I mean, he did stay 15 months in Japan and training at Hombu, so he saw the Uchideshis and know how hard that was. Um, just to wrap that up, because this is where the chapter finishes, um, I was there to chase a dream, obviously, but one of the dreams of uh, going there and becoming that Uchideshi was that there had really been no foreigner to complete the three years ever uh, up until that point. And so Mokoram was in his third year and about to graduate, like one more year. Um, uh, Judd was in his second year and Liga was also in his second year. So... Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was like, okay, it's going to be one of us. You know, if we all make it to the end, which we kind of used to joke around a lot about. Um, it was, yeah, definitely exciting times. Um, there's a lot more to the story. Um, thank you guys for listening to it today. That was Chapter 3 of The Blue-Eyed Samurai with your host, Nicholas Pace.